I think we're live. Wow. <laughs> we're testing the limits of StreamYard here. I know we've got lots of little <laughs> icons popping up. Um, I'm actually really excited about this um, session of the Blazer Community Standup because lots of icons means lots of people. Um, today is a new session of this community standup. So I've got all of my fellow engineers and PMs and whatnot who work on Blazer here today. Um, to talk a little bit about what they do, who they are, um, and all that other fun stuff. So you can kind of meet the people behind the code. Um, I always think that's as equally as interesting as the actual code itself is the people who built it. You can learn as much about it from them as you would from just reading it um, or whatnot. So yeah, we're gonna have a fun little panel with folks on the Blazor team. Um, we have myself, Safia here today. Uh, we have Javier, who's an icon I see. We've got Pranav, who's also an engineer on the team. Um, and we have two more familiar faces that you've seen before, Dan and Steve, who are also joining us today. And last but not least on the Blazor team, I'm going to butcher pronouncing your name, Alon. Did I get it right? <laughs> I think that was right. You got, oh my you got my name right, but can I <laughs> add one small thing? Yes. You said you were introducing engineers, PMs, and whatnot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're the, the whatnot. Right too. <laughs> <laughs> and one whatnot. Mono whatnot. Yeah. Who's the whatnot? Answer the question, please. <laughs> you are the whatnot. That's you were it's kind of in sequential order. We've got the engineers, the PMs, and the whatnots. But no, I've um, always been nervous about pronouncing your name. I remember on a previous community stand-up, someone had mentioned mobile blazer bindings. And I was like, oh yeah, it's made by that guy. And I mispronounced your name. So I looked extremely capable I, when I did that. So Not that I'm trying to draw too strong of a comparison, but my very own grandmother could not pronounce my name. <laughs> okay, I feel so, a lot more comfortable now. Well, now one of my grandmother could not. One grandmother could pronounce my name. The other grandmother could not. So it's kind of 50-50. Yeah. And I've saved the best for last because joining me is my wonderful co-host, John. Um, I, I'm having too much fun right now. I'm spotlighting all these people joining us from all around the world. It's, it's amazing. It's just wow. always so fun. Yeah, we've got people, Vietnam, Bangladesh, wow. all, I know, people all over the world. So it's always That's so pretty. exciting. Yep. 
Well, I'm just happy to be here. I, I love being part of the ASP.NET and the .NET community stand up just because I get to tang along and hear these conversations. So yeah. Hooray. <laughs> cool. So I think we're ready to get started. We usually start this off with um, my new favorite session, which is community links. Um, so I've been assembling a couple of links over the past few weeks of things that I thought would be super interesting to share with people. Um, let me zoom in here. Um, I'm going to start off with the links that are actually kind of me self-promoting, um, but bear with me. All right, so a couple of... Uh, taking over. It's all yes. links in ours. <laughs> There's good reason for this. There's a good reason for this. Okay, so a couple of weeks ago, or I would say months ago right now, um, I wrote a blog post that was kind of going under the hood um, with the debugging infrastructure in Blazor WebAssembly. Um, I know we get a lot of um, feature requests and bug reports around Blazor WebAssembly, and I thought it would be really interesting for people to be able to understand how it works end to end. Um, so I wrote up this blog post that kind of like talks about the technology that's used, what happens when you start a debugging session, um, all of the different things that come into play to make it work um, for debugging in Blazor WebAssembly which is actually kind of a mix of and a blend of a lot of really different technologies from both um, the web and .NET. Um, I brought this up not just because I wanted to self-promote, but because someone in the community um, actually reached out to me about translating the article to Japanese. Um, and I figured I'd share this because I think this is actually a great way to bring up something um, that's a great way to contribute to the Blazor community if you don't feel like you have the knowledge to write an article from scratch or contribute to an open source project or whatnot, um, you can translate existing articles. So someone reached out to me and said, hey, can I translate this into Japanese? I was like, sure. They translated it into Japanese. I don't speak Japanese, so I can't um, authenticate it, but I'm pretty sure it's um, accurate and great. So. If you have ever wondered, hey, I kind of want to be more involved in the community and do something, um, but I don't really, I don't feel like I know anything or I don't know what to do. Um, if you speak a language um, as other than English, which is what blog posts are typically written in, this is a great opportunity to kind of translate work um, and make sure that we have content in all these different languages for Blazor. This is actually interesting to bring up because I think last community stand up. Um, we shared an open source project by a Blazor community member in Japan. So we've kind of got a streak going here with um, Japanese-based content in Blazor. You know, awesome. while you're mentioning that, it, just a reminder too, is that people can also help translate docs and there mm -hmm. are docs in other, you know, in other languages. And, and um, so that's also really helpful. A lot of people, have, that's a great way to get started just in open source in general. Yeah. And, and, you know, so yeah, this is great to see. Yeah, that's a great idea. There's just something about reading documentation, especially technical documentation in your native tongue that um, just makes it a little bit easier to understand in graphs. So there's that. Well, that, that awesome. Blazor, Blazor WebAssembly debugging blog post has got to be an interesting read, like, because uh, it's, it's magical stuff. Like, how you yeah. are able to, like, debug into .NET code that's running inside of WebAssembly on a JavaScript runtime in a browser. Uh, that was uh, that was no small feat. So that's a that's a good blog post to take a look at to see what's happening there under the hood. Yeah, thanks for uh, tooting my horn, stroking <laughs> my ego, Dan. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm, I'm going to read that. Yeah, and also check it out if you speak Japanese because you can do that now. Cool. So the other links I have are kind of like. Um, well, let's start with these. So um, one of the things that we kind of get a lot of um, bug reports or questions about in our ASP.NET Core repo around Blazor are related around pre-rendering or authentication. We kind of get people who are looking for more docs um, or just have questions about how they work and whatnot. Whatnot is the word of the day, if you have not noticed. <laughs> so. so with that in mind, I kind of picked up two articles that I spotted over the past couple of weeks around these topics. Um, one of them is from John Hilton. Let me pop it open here. Um, and it covers pre-rendering um, with Blazor WebAssembly, which is um, something that we get questions about quite frequently. What I really like about this article is that it kind of breaks it up into digestible chunks. Um, you know, sometimes you don't want to go to the docs that just tell you how to do something. You want to kind of read something that explains it bit by bit and kind of covers how the different components are coming into place. So I think this article does a great job of covering that. They also have a fantastic diagram 
um, of the Blazor WebAssembly flow. I've kind of talked about how um, a lot of blog posts will have different diagrams that convey how Blazor WebAssembly works. And I like the way they did theirs. There's a cute little stick figure and lots of nice clear text and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I definitely recommend checking this article out if you've ever had questions about pre-rendering with Blazor WebAssembly, if you felt like the docs were confusing, um, or if you're having trouble um, getting it working, this article would be great help to you. It's a two-parter, so it's very thorough. Um, you're guaranteed to find um, what you need in there. And thanks to John Hilton for, for writing this and also for taking the time to assemble these visuals. I know that takes a lot of time to do, sometimes more than the writing is drawing out all those little pictures. Um, that, that's really insightful of him to to do that because I think one of the more confusing things, it, just in general for for the web, you know, and web developers that are new to the web, is what's happening in the browser and what's happening in the server. And then for a while with the you know static HTML based, it was like, well, this is happening here and this is you know, and now it kind of blurs the lines. And then especially with WebAssembly, and now we've got pre rendering, and now we've got server side and client side. It's this is really helpful to understand exactly what's happening, where to understand and develop and troubleshoot. Yeah, you're totally right, John. The concept count is pretty high, so visuals mm -hmm. are a great way to kind of like discern all the different moving parts. Yeah. Another thing where the concept count is really high, authentication, because securing the web can be <laughs> difficult sometimes, but it's also very necessary. Um, so I wanted to share this um, really um, two things, concise, straight to the point, but it's really easy to kind of grab relevant pieces of code and integrate them into your own application. Um, those are in by Yassine Kavlik. Um, I hope I pronounced your name right. Um, I'm kind of in a streak of pronouncing names right, so <laughs> hopefully that one. Um, so yeah, if you've ever wanted to get um, started with role-based auth in Blazor WebAssembly, um, we've got documentation on that, but if the docs weren't enough or you wanted something that was more end-to-end, -end, um, then check out Yassine's tutorial. He kind of covers everything from creating um, your template project, um, all of the code that you need to write, commands you need to execute. Um, so really clear and straightforward content. I'm always on the eye for that or on the lookout for that because um, there's um, those are always really helpful. Cool. So yeah, those two things cover stuff that I know a lot of people come to us with questions. Um, thanks to folks in the community who write blog posts about it because that always helps to have kind of different perspectives and tutorials out there for these things. Last but not least is an oddity I found. It's not an oddity, it's just something that I think is interesting. So I work at Microsoft, which means I spent a lot of my time on Microsoft Teams. Um, what I knew but wasn't very intimately aware of was the fact that Teams had kind of like this app framework where you could build apps for Teams. Um, and so I was kind of browsing around the net and I saw that someone had created an open source project um, called Blazor Teams, which essentially allows you to write these Microsoft Teams apps in Blazor. Um, I really like the article that they've written about this. They kind of explain the motivation for doing this. They talk about how you can get up, set up with building a um, Microsoft Teams app with Blazor um, using their tool um, and then deploying your app and basically kind of like the end to end of that experience. Um, their code is pretty interesting to read too. This is a new project as well. So if you're kind of interested in um, the intersection between these two things, Blazor and Teams, um, definitely recommend checking it out. Um, I think the code is pretty fun to read um, and the concept is really interesting. It's great to see Blazor working its way into lots of different places. Um, so yeah, thanks. I think it's Mika Berglund is the name of the author. Hopefully that's three for three on my street for very cool. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks for creating this open source project and for writing this blog post. It's super neat to see kind of Blazor crossing into different worlds. Um, and that was my community links for for today. Um, thanks for folks who sent me stuff to take a look at. As always, if you think that there's um, something interesting that you you've written or someone else in the community has written and you'd like it to be showcased, feel free to ping me on Twitter. Um, and I will probably read it while I'm waiting for something to build. So <laughs> there's that. Awesome. And I think um, we are ready to get started with the second part of the um, session, which I'm really excited about. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, so I was kind of thinking, how do we kick off the new year with these Blazor community standups? Um, we kind of 
rounded out the year by having community members and maintainers of different projects talk a little bit about what they're working on um, and kind of who they are and what their interests are. Figured it'd be interesting to kick it off by having everyone on the Blazor development team here um, just to talk about themselves, what they work on, all this fun stuff, so you can kind of get to know us a little bit. So I've assembled a set of questions that I'm going to ask folks. Some of them are kind of fun and silly, and some are a little bit more serious. Um, and we'll kind of just do it a panel style, and it'll be just fun and chill. And of course, we will be taking questions from the audience. So if there's questions that you want to ask anyone on the engineering or PM teams, um, or just anything in general, feel free to drop them and we'll answer your questions as well. Um, but yeah, we'll kind of just be doing a little Q and A with folks. Just, just a point of clarification though. Like, so we have some of the Blazor team. There's, I think our talks is yes. here. People may have seen our talk quite a bit on, on GitHub. He unfortunately wasn't able to make it. Uh, and also this group of people is just a set of folks that work directly on the like Blazor framework. Um, but we collaborate and, and and work with like a whole bunch of other teams that also contribute heavily to Blazor so that that aren't here right now. Uh, for example, like all the folks that work on the WebAssembly runtime, there's a whole team that handles that. There's a team that handles all the Razor and Blazor related tooling in Visual Studio. Um, there's a team that handles like the IL linker that we use to like trim down the assembly. So there's, there's a bunch of other folks that actually work on Blazor but yeah. these are the folks that are dealing directly with the, the Blazor framework itself. We are hands on it. Yeah, I think if we had everyone who was involved <laughs> in making Blazor possible, we would probably break our streaming service. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we cool. cool people. You know, we only, you know, we, we had to select from that. Credit. Yeah, I just picked the most <laughs> cool people of the lot. Everybody right. else's. Um, but no, cool. So I thought I'd, we'd kick it off by a fun question or with a fun question. Um, so I'm actually going to start it off myself just to get the ball rolling. I think it would be fun to start it off with two truths and a lie. Um, so if you're unfamiliar, two truths and a lie is kind of a fun get to know you question where you share three things about yourself. Two of them are true. One of them is false. And then everybody else kind of has to guess which is the one that is true and which is one that is false. I don't think we've ever played this team as a, or this game as a team, at least not since I've joined, so this will kind of be fun. Okay, so let me go ahead and share my uh, two truths and a lie. Uh, okay, one, I have five tattoos. Two, I've been to Disney World three times. Three, I have written and published a book. Which is the lie, folks? Written and published a book. Go, go over again. I need to hear them again. Like, so, written and published a book. This was three years. times and um, five tattoos. Yeah. Five tattoos. Definitely, she has five tattoos. No, no question. That one's obvious. <laughs> I think it's number two. <laughs> I've been to Disney World. Wait, Disney World or Disneyland? Disney World. Disney World. I've been there a lot, right? and I never saw you there. I, yeah. I, used to, I used to live. I used to live two miles away from there. I used to live two really? miles away from there. Yeah, like this and so we went there a lot, and I there. never saw you there. Mm. Okay, so you think I'm you were lying wearing about a Mouse costume? I might have been. I might have been one or of those princesses costume, like. or whatnot. A, a lot of votes in the chat are saying three about the book. No, oh. no, 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 no. She definitely I not. Know. That I think it's Disney no. World. I think it's the, who who goes to Disney World three times. She's probably been. Well, I have at least five. Dan, don't be a hater. Elon did not see her there. I mean, we uh, this no. is scientific. Yeah, he didn't see me there, therefore it did not happen. That's I, I, I lived in Lakeland, Florida. It's like a few miles away from Disney. And you, you get discounts if you live in the area. So we used to go there all the time. And uh, yeah. <laughs> all right. Who's, so who's voting for three? Um, never been an author. Or I have the fact that I have published. Not that one. It's not that one. Not that one. Mm -hmm. Disney World? Disney World. It's definitely Disney World. Disney World. She's been to Disney World like 10. Okay, and five <laughs> tattoos? <laughs> okay, okay, you, you're all one. I have never been to Disney World or Disneyland at all yes! in my life. Whoa. I know. Never? Is over no, never. 
I was surprised. I thought I was really going to throw you off with the tattoos. <laughs> I, I joined the team after um, lockdown started. And so we weren't ever, no one's seen me in person. And I always figure people wouldn't assume I'm the kind of person who would have five tattoos, but maybe I'm a lot more obvious <laughs> a tattoo person than I thought. Never, never assume what kind of person has tattoos. That's what I've learned over the years. <laughs> That's really juicy to be to be a lie. That one had to be true. It was like, okay, that one, that one's got to be the one that you know, thrown out there. That's yeah, yeah. Now the question really is, what are all the tattoos? But uh, we, you know, oh. <laughs> so I, I one that better be blazer. Yeah, yeah. Not yet. Yeah. So for what it's worth, I got all of these like when I was eighteen, nineteen. So immediately after it became legal for me to get a tattoo, I got all of them in like, but I have, I have a, let's see if I can show it. I have this one, oh. which is like, okay. yeah. It's like, it's, it's like cyborg thing. Yeah, no, it's, it's a no, cyborg it's, and a this flower. This is cyberpunk. No, this, yeah. flower, okay. I thought it was like, like, like a circuit yeah. board, like wiring thing, but no, I see the leaves on it now. It's more organic than that. It's both. It's kind of circuit board wiring and then leaves. It mm -hmm. interconnects with leaves yeah oh, okay um and then i've got two tattoos on my shoulder <laughs> i've got one on my finger which i call my functional fu i hope that's <laughs> <one last name. laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> right um, and i think i think that's it um and then i've got like a date on my arm so those are my five tattoos um gosh i, I I really thought I had you folks with that. Right? Like, What's going on? <laughs> All uh, right. Who wants to be sacrificed next at the oh, altar? Shoot, of I gotta think of my uh, Pro doing? tip: write write down your lies in Notepad so that when you're asked to repeat them, you repeat them the same. Otherwise, That's true. Uh, three, you're three, very three, experienced three. with this. That's very suspicious. <laughs> All right. Do you want to go next? I've never, I've never played this actually, so I don't know. Okay. Well, this is your your chance to hit us with two truths and a lie. Hmm. Well, let me think. Hmm. Um, I'm trying to find a picture. My my kid. Well, you're. I'll just to let you stall. Um, my kid was doing henna tattoo something. And I let her practice by giving me a Zune guy tattoo on my shoulder. <laughs> so I have the picture, but it didn't turn out that great. Oh, well. You know, it's, it's harder to come up with truths about myself than lies, because lies are infinite. But truths, I, I, in some sense, are infinite, but they're much more restrictive. That's very deep. The best lies are the ones that are like kind of true. Not quite. Yeah, know. exactly. That, that, yeah, that's, actually, like, that's actually very challenging to, to do, where it's kind of plausible. Hmm. You also... I just, I need to share my... <laughs> there it is. All right. Yes. Yeah. Oh, do any of those devices still exist? <laughs> my so my last have... one broke. Yeah. So now you have to do a blazer tattoo, John. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Okay, I am. I am ready. Yes. Okay, by the way, well, I'm doing it. Okay. Give us, give us more time to come up. Okay. Yeah. Everybody else, like, get, start getting ready when it's for when it's your turn, because this, this is this is unless you've actually done it, I think it's much harder than it seems. And I've never played this before, so I have no actually have no experience. Um, okay. So uh, here are here are the three. Here are the three. Um, I have uh, been to Bill Gates's house. Uh, I have broken ten different bones in my body, and uh, everyone in my immediate family has the exact same initials. Now, I know some people here probably know, but I don't think the uh, whether some of these are true or not. But I think some folks in the community probably don't know me nearly as well. Aren't you the yeah. protagonist of the movie Unbreakable? Like, I don't think you have a broken bone. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> People do confuse me for Br Bruce Willis, uh, unlike John Galloway, <laughs> who looks nothing like Bruce Willis. So I would believe I would believe the first one because I know 
at, at some point. Were you ever an intern at Microsoft? Am I supposed to answer that? Am I legally answer that. obligated? But that would it does seem like there's yeah. a good chance he was, right? Yeah, I know, I know at some point. I, I know the answer already. What Javier, enlighten us. He he went to Bill Gates' house, I'm sure of it, because he was on the internet at some point. Uh, he broke uh, 10 bones on his back because uh, he had a bike accident a very long time ago or something like that, I remember. And the last one is false. Right, but was it 10 bones? Maybe it was like eight. Maybe it was 11. I actually do, I, I, I'm kind of in agreement with you, Javier. You do seem like the kind of person who breaks bones. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Break is it, oh, I am the person who yes. breaks bone, or, or Elon just has a tendency to, to get his bones, his bones Full broken. confession, every bone in my body was broken by Javier directly. <laughs> exactly. Someone had commented, I thought this was amusing, the twist is that he broke 10 bones in Bill Gates' house, which I think is the ac most accurate. <laughs> yeah, I guess it doesn't say, did I was I breaking other people's bones, or was I breaking my bones? Yeah. Like, maybe I was in Bill Gates' house, like, in a rage about, you know, yeah. Windows XP or something. <laughs> yeah, and the security team took care of it. Yes, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm gonna vote for the third one is false. The third one's what? That's the, he hasn't- It was uh, Bill Gates' house, broken 10 bones, and everyone in my family has the same initials. Everyone has the same initials. I know, <laughs> I know at least doesn't two members of his family have the same initials, but I don't know that all of them have the same initial. I think it's that one as well. They all do. They all do? Yeah, Dan. Everyone. No, I think it's the initials one. I'm going with the initials. Okay. It's number two. Okay, Javier Bones? and Dan and I are going initials. John and Pranav oh. are going bones. Steve, yeah. you yeah. break the tie. <laughs> well, I trust Javier's insights on this. So. <laughs> he's got, he's got Show a mug. the answer right there. Oh, oh. my gosh. You have a mug. <laughs> so wait, which is the line? It must be the right, it's got to be the bones, and it'll be a different number, just not 10. Steve, Steve, mm -hmm. Steve is right. I, I've broken, bones. I don't know, it's not 10. I think it's like seven or eight different bones. Mm. Not okay, all right. bones. I know you have had some broken bones in your, in your history. Yeah, maybe it's nine, but it's not 10. It's not 10 bones. Yeah, I've been to Bill Gates' house twice when I was an intern back in 2000 and 2001. Uh, you know, just hanging out, you know, chatting about stuff. That's one of us. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I've broken many bones, but not quite 10. And everybody in my family has the same initials. That's why I'm, uh, I'm the original oh. PJL, and everybody else is just a clone. Uh, there you go. Darn, you got us there. Yeah, All now right. everybody knows my password too. Oh, wonderful. All right, Pradov, you're up next on the altar. Can I'm I, can I just, All right. yes. can I throw out, um, after Pranav, do you mind if we go to a few questions in the chat? Because we have some people saying like, hey, we've got some tech questions. And wanna, oh yeah, and sure. We'll, and that, that'll uh, give people time to think. <laughs> this gives Javier, Steve, and Dan a chance to think of some really good ones. Right. I've got my three. I'm ready when when you when well, you. Yeah. Okay. Um, right. I, I think I can do this. So um, my theme is a dozen. So I'm gonna go with that. Um, so statement one is I once um, ate twelve dozen full size samosas. Like if you don't know what that is, look it up on the internet. Um, yeah. Wait, no. Oh, sorry. A dozen, a dozen. Not like just one dozen. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> um, okay, it's number one. Um, when the movie came out, I watched Lion King in theater 12 times. Um, and then this year I picked um, like 12 pounds of cherries from like the cherry tree in my backyard. Mm. Mm. I well, do know you have a cherry tree in your backyard. I think you were mentioning that it was I think that one's true. I don't think the first is possible. 12 samosas, you could do it if you're hungry, but Lion King 12 times. Like, wouldn't you be crying so much you couldn't watch it again? Yeah. 
Though I've actually never seen Lion King, so I don't know. Yeah, I am voting for You've Never Eaten Troll Samosas. And if you have, I would like to see you do it again at some point. <laughs> uh, live streamed, by the way. Like, yes. On the, on the camera. Next Blazer Community stand up is Prana Eating Troll Samosas. I, I think it's Lion King. Because he's oh, lying man. about Lion King. King. It's always the middle one. That's it. Oh. It's Lion King. Yeah. All right. I'm sticking to my samosas. Dan? I think it's Lion King. All Go right. with Lion King. Yeah. Steve, Javier, you know Pranav. You've worked with him for a long time. You can tell when he's lying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer to this, but I'm going to guess the Lion King. Okay. I'm, I'm feeling yeah. outnumbered. All right. Pranav, enlighten us. I watched it a nine times, not eleven, twelve times. Ah, <laughs> me. See, we are so okay, mortified. So I actually I have to see you eat twelve samosas. Yeah, now we gotta do it. That was the agreement. Yeah. There's gotta do one more. Thirteen. Next, next week you stand up. <laughs> yeah. All right, John. Do we want to go through some uh, questions from members of the community? Oh um, gosh. Okay. Yeah, I should have been on that. Let me see. Oh no, it's okay. totally fine. No. Okay. So. Um, Actually, here's here's one. We've had a few people asking about like Tailwind CSS. There have been a few questions on this, but just like different CSS frameworks and stuff. I see Steve nodding his head. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? I've been using Tailwind on a bunch of like, prototype and sort of demo app type projects lately and finding it to be really pleasant to use. Um, but I've been basically just bypassing the hard parts of it by just dumping in the complete Tailwind CSS file and not actually building it. Um, so that I know that's kind of cheating, but I would imagine that for a lot of uh, internet type applications, there's there's literally no point in doing anything more complicated than that. Who cares if your CSS file is five kilobytes or 15 kilobytes, it's really not making any difference. Um, if you are really insistent on compressing, you know, on shaving out that extra 10 kilobytes, then yeah, go for it, set up some Webpack. Um, it, it's probably not easy. It's probably going to take a, a couple of hours of messing about, but, I, but I'm sure it's possible. Cool. All right, I got whoever, two more. Whoever does it successfully, I guess, has to write the blog post on how to do it for the for the rest of the community. Yes. It's that hard. That would be great. All right, question on best recommendations for Blazor development scalability. And I think we have some docs. I'm guessing we have some docs. Well, it depends on what they mean by, do they mean scalability yeah. to like a large team or do they mean scalability to like scale out the app? I don't know. Yeah, We definitely do have some docs on scaling out Blazor server apps and some recommendations there. Um, I don't know if we have anything on scaling, developing with Blazor, although I think the same semantics for any other framework would apply. All right, one more here. This this one's just asking about offline support for Blazor Server, and I, you know, I mean, there is PWA support, which is one thing. No, not for Blazor Server. WebAssembly. Oh, that's right, yeah. WebAssembly. Okay, good point. It's very nature is online. Yeah, yeah the way, like, way Blazor Server works, right? Is you set up a real time connection between the server and the browser. You have a an active WebSocket connection, and that's being used to drive all of the UI interactions. You click on buttons. You you do whatever in the browser that's being pumped to the server where your components run and then the DOM diffs get calculated and because the components render and that gets sent back down to the browser. So without that connection, you know, if you're offline, there's the app doesn't even function. There's no way to even uh, have the, the UI to, to function. So there's no, yeah, there's no possibility of offline support for Blazor server. That said, if you wanted to make a Blazor server PWA that doesn't work offline, but still could be installed, like have an installable experience, uh, you could do that, and that is something that uh, we could consider if people find that interesting. We only enabled the PWA option for Blazor WebAssembly because it really gives you the full PWA experience. You we could do the same thing with the Blazor template. We just haven't done that yet. If people uh, think that would be useful, let us know. Cool. All right, that was the three questions I promised. So who's up next, Safia? Awesome. I, I summon Dan All right. for service. <laughs> okay. I, I just have to say, well, shoot. There's one that I hoped it would be, but but uh, everyone knows the funny story about Dan. So they're no, no, they're don't not... say anything. Don't say anything. <laughs> okay, don't okay. say anything. Okay, <laughs> they're all funny. All stories about Dan are funny, so it's okay. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> my three 
absolutely truthful things about myself. Number one, I have been deported from China with several bags of white powdered sugar in my suitcase. Number two, I worked on the team that invented the Roomba vacuum cleaner. Number three, I play on a competitive curling team. I know the first one is true. I know the answer told. from them. It wasn't sugar. It wasn't sugar. Wait, is the third one, do you continue playing or was it, did you at some point play? I play on a competitive curling team. Wow. Huh. I think they're all true. <laughs> I think I don't think you had any part in bringing the Roomba to life. He was curling with oh, a Roomba did. in China no. to scoop up the white you. powder <laughs> and got deported because of it. They're all true at the same it's all one event. That's the beauty of Dan. So, yeah, Dan went to MIT. He probably did. Like he probably literally manufactured Roomba out of thin air. I didn't know you went to MIT either. Was the Roomba invented at MIT? Mm. He needed an automated way to scoop up all the white powder that was on the floor of his <laughs> farm. Hmm. I know right, he's I'm going gonna... to China. No, it's number two. Yeah, um, I'm thinking two as well. Two seems, uh, two and three are both. Like, so. There's like another tidbit about Dan, like Dan does like Lego robotics. If he invented like the Roomba, like, you know, he would just be crushing the whole thing. Right? Be just like... <laughs> well, it's his kids that do it. Yeah, kids, like He'll just be like, look, here's a piece of the Roomba AI. Like you don't even need yeah, to figure it out. We'll figure out. Let me do that for you. That's... <laughs> all right, Dan, we're all on the edge of our seats. You have to let us know which one it is. All right, so everyone thinks it's, it's which one? The, what was, it was, well, anyway. Uh, Roomba. Roomba. I guess we're going with Roomba, I guess. I will go yeah. in order. No, okay. Or, or, okay. All right. I was in fact deported from China with several bags of white powdered sugar in my suitcase. My, my, my most many of the members of my team know this story. I, I did like a, a work rotation in Shanghai. And my wife and I and kids were there. And I had to come back to Redmond to to the States uh, to do a talk. Uh, and I didn't know at the time that I had a zero entry visa. Like I had been renewed as a zero entry visa. So I was able to get into China once. And then when I left, I didn't actually have a visa to get back in. Um, and so they they let me get on the plane. I got all the way back to Shanghai and I didn't actually have a visa to get into the country again. And so they had to deport me back to the United States. And I, I spent a night in a hotel room with like a couple of Chinese police officers. So they made sure I wouldn't run for it, which I did actually consider doing <laughs> <laughs> uh, briefly. And my wife loves to bake. And there, there isn't, well, at least when we were in China, there weren't a lot of people that baked, like ovens weren't really a thing. And so she asked me to bring back some baking supplies. So in my suitcase, I had several bags of white powdered sugar. <laughs> anyway, so that one's true. That, that didn't happen. The funniest I've, uh, the hardest I've ever laughed was the first time actually Glenn Condren told me that story. We were jet lagged and we were in Australia at NDC Sydney, and he started telling me the story. I'm like, this can't be true. And he just went on and on, and I was just dying laughing. And then I like saw you face to face. I'm like, is this really true? And you told me again in London, and I just fell over laughing. The same. It couch. wasn't funny at the time. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't funny, but it is now. Uh, okay, second one. I was an intern at iRobot, and I worked on the team that uh, built the original Roomba. Uh, I worked on, I, my job was specifically to test Roomba's floor coverage. Uh, so I had to write some like uh, like vision tracking soft, some like the video uh, video tracking software to like watch the Roomba as it ran around the floor. I had, I set up these little like uh, posts on the floor to simulate table legs and chair legs and stuff to see, does the Roomba actually cover this room size in this amount of time? And so I did that for, for a summer while they were developing the original Roomba robot. And I had one for for a while. Uh, it uh, eventually did die, and we we, we mourn its passing. But uh, yeah, I did that, uh, and it was uh, a spinoff kind of from from folks from MIT. So it was a little bit tied to MIT. That was all in the Cambridge area while I was in Boston. I have played curling before as like a team morale event, but I do not play curling on a competitive curling team. 
sorry to disappoint all you curling fans out there. <laughs> One or two times that I have done it, it was great fun, but no, I am not a competitive curler. But you've played a hand in helping keep living rooms clean all across the world. So. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Steve, I'm really excited for to nominate you next for this. All right then. Uh, well, I'm gonna slightly copy one of someone else's things from earlier, um, for one of mine. Uh, so number one, I have written and published a self-help book. Number two, I am growing a watermelon tree. Number three, I am a fully qualified barista. Wait a minute. Watermelons don't grow in trees. I will go for the first one. He doesn't know the first thing about watermelons. They're not trees. <laughs> Boom, it's Steve. Self-help book? Steve has published a self-help book? No, but it's probably like a watermelon tree is probably like a British euphemism for like <laughs> candy cane or something. I don't, you know, it's probably there's all kinds of like British things that we uh, Americans or or uh, Spaniards or others just don't know. Yeah. Now, now I do know that there are large watermelon like fruits that do grow on trees. Like there's a jackfruit or like in Brazil they call it like a jaca fruit, and it's like a watermelon sized thing on these huge trees. And I'm always we joke people like, like no. don't walk underneath a jackfruit tree because one of those things falls on your head, you're gonna die. Um, yeah, no, there's no, there's no water. I have to say, it's the first one. I, I'm thinking it's the first one. Oh, Steve, if you've I know, one, I know he, he, he's capable with, with a coffee machine. I've seen, we've seen stuff. his latte art, yeah, yeah. exactly. Wait, he does, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's a professional qualification, but given that I cannot do it, I would call that professional. And he's never joined us to make coffee when he was around. So disappointing. Oh, he didn't want to gloat. <laughs> he's British. Yeah, he's very kind of more I subdued. think it's a fully qualified barista. I think he's a great barista, but I, I question the qualifications. Whoa. Okay. It's fighting words. <laughs> watermelon. <laughs> I'm going to go with watermelon. Yeah. I'm going with watermelon. Yeah. All right, I, I like John's theory for the barista, but... I think watermelon, just because it's it's out there. But maybe that's why Steve mentioned it. So the reverse, reverse, reverse psychology aspect. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Good try, everyone. Well, I'm deliberately <laughs> being slightly unfair because they all involve a certain element of untruth to them. Mm -hmm. um, but the first two are true enough that I'm counting them as true, and the third one is not. So. Um, <laughs> I have written and published a self-help book uh, that helps you as long as what you're trying to do is write code. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> oh. We're all going right, to right right now <laughs> looking up what you published back in 1998. Of highly effective laser developers. <laughs> yeah, I knew he was, he was published. I knew he was published. That that was that. I, I buy that one. I give you that one. I think that, right. that was fair. I am growing a watermelon tree. I know you dispute whether or not this plant is actually a tree, uh, but it is a plant. <laughs> it's quite a tree, tree like. Oh, look at that. There it is. Oh I was going to grab my copy. Yep. Um, and, and John is right. While I've been working on my barista skills uh, frantically and feverishly since the lockdown started, I, I've not become fully qualified. So that's why I still have to continue in this day job. As soon as I become qualified, I'm gone. How do you become fully qualified, though? Like, is there a certification? Yeah, there's like a monastery that you have to go to, and <laughs> you stay there for, for a few months. You have to be an and, apprentice like, for yeah. two years, right? It's like the plot yeah. line of Doctor You have Street. to be a, a journeyman barista for two years. You have to learn how to start every sentence with, well, actually. And um, <laughs> yeah. you, need a, you need a beard as well. I haven't got a beard. Yeah. I'm fully qualified to operate an espresso machine, which is. <laughs> That'll get you far. All right. B before Javier goes, I got a few more questions, if that's okay. Yeah. All right. So let me see. There were some good ones. Um, there are a few about hot reload and just in general, laser supporting hot reload and when's it coming and blah, blah, blah. Wow. Well. <laughs> so <It's> really excited. <laughs> laser directly currently today does not support hot reload specifically like that's the state management aspect where you can like leave the app running and the sort of hot patch in 
new code into the running app and leave your state as is. That is not something that Blazor supports today. There are some third-party projects out there that do enable hot uh, reload with uh, um, frameworks like Blazor. I think it was Life Sharp is one. I think it's a, a, a paid product, but uh, there are some community projects out there that you might look at, but it doesn't support it today. We do have like auto refresh where you can, um, when you're editing in Visual Studio or if you're using .NET Watch Run from the command line, it will watch for file changes and then quickly kill the process, rebuild it and restart it again, hopefully before you really notice uh, so that you can see your UI changes quickly. But obviously that doesn't maintain any state. For .NET 6, we are working on hot reload and we expect to have a hot reload story for Blazor, uh, as well as really across the board. It's not just a Blazor specific effort. We're working on hot reload across uh, all the UI frameworks in, uh, in .NET 6. So that is something that's being actively worked on. I don't know, Steve, if you want to share any more from your experiments in this space. No, I think you've covered it. So yeah, it's something I'm personally looking forward to very much. It's uh, one of the biggest uh, kind of gaps, I would say, between where we are and where I've always envisioned Blazor to get to. So yeah, I'm really strongly looking forward to having that feature. You know, one, one area that we are interested in getting more feedback from people uh, about Hot Reload specifically is there will probably be some style, some kinds of edits that will allow for Hot Reload. Let's call them polite edits. Um, you know, if you just uh, uh, change the method of the code in the method body, things like that, that we'll be able to pretty easily patch into the, the IL. There will be other kinds of edits that let's call them rude edits that will not be patchable into the app. And how how much, uh, what, how, ma how many kinds of edits we can support as polite edits versus rude edits is one thing we're really trying to, to figure out right now. Um, so we'll be looking to get feedback from folks in the community, like what, what types of edits do you want to be able to do without having to lose state? Like what, what are the really critical things and, um, that need to, to, to work. Uh, if you're, if you have feedback on that, feel free to comment on the, the hot reload GitHub issue for, for Blazor. Uh, and, uh, we'll also be reaching out to folks to, to, to investigate that further. All right. Question on manipulating Dom outside of JavaScript. Who wants to take this one? Oh. Have you ever pronounced? Sure. Like we don't have any plans to do so at the moment within within C sharp. That's that's pretty much it. it you know, it's interesting to me in general because there's some things that JavaScript does really well and like in, you know, integration with the browser. I, like I get some people are just like, I don't want to do any JavaScript at all. But part of what I like about Blazor is that it runs on native web technologies. So I don't know, it's always kind of interesting to me to see like where the line is and stuff. Yeah, so like direct DOM manipulation is 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 kind of an interesting thing. Like if you if you're just getting started with JavaScript, you most likely probably get exposed to going in and grabbing a DOM element and doing stuff to it. That's not how Blazor works. Like Blazor is much more high level. It, it's much more like a framework like React or Angular, where you write components and the components uh, specify their rendering logic. And then Blazor looks at what the component renders and figures out how much of the DOM actually needs to be touched. It does very fancy diff calculations to figure out what exactly changed. And then it updates the DOM for you on your behalf. And the nice thing about that is it's much more efficient, right? Like you're not, um, you're not uh, touching the DOM unnecessarily. Um, but there are cases where we've heard people have asked that they'd like to be able to do DOM manipulation uh, directly. Doing that from .NET code, uh, crossing that boundary from .NET to DOM is probably going to be a bit heavy. Um, so writing an entire app that way might not be the most practical thing uh, with a, a Blazor .NET on WebAssembly-like uh, solution. Um, but we have been talking about whether or not we need to at least expose more lower level functionality like that in the, the stack. Uh, if those scenarios are important to you, let us know about them and uh, we'll we'll consider them. All right, two more quick ones here, both on converting. So this is converting Blazor server to use Azure SignalR for scale. Oh, yeah, well, I mean, that should be very trivial. Like we have docs yeah. specifically how to do that. That's actually our recommended setup for handling connection scale out. Cool. Um, yeah. And then I guess like for how many connections will it handle? Um, like 
the Azure Signal service should, you know, technically, theoretically, like, you know, handle as many connections as you can throw at it, just because it has like scale out built into it. Um, for your own app to be able to um, handle all these connections, like obviously you're going to be bound by things like, you know, how much memory your app is allocating to do like work as part of its component rendering and things like that. All right, migrating Blazor server to client side. This is interesting. Like, let, let me give my wrong answer and then you can correct me. But like what I've done in the past is re really like a few lines of code to change, you know, in the, the um, reference JavaScript to copy. Like I'll create both and I'll copy from one to the other. But I think the bigger problem then you run into is there's assumptions that you make, like you may be running if you're got a, if you have a blazor server app you're going to be like running directly against some sort of you know you may be calling directly into your database or whatever right so yeah those yeah. are the kind of bigger problems you'll run into with just like so that's why you wouldn't just have a tool that just says flip the switch right you could imagine yeah. something that does just the project aspects like switching out the javascript like it's it's not it's not very complicated to switch a Blazor WebAssembly app to Bla to Blazor Server and vice versa. You're you're basically just flipping the the ver the JavaScript file that you use, and then setting up the uh, the the, 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 the WebAssembly piece needs to live in a different project. So you have to move any pieces any of the Blazor stuff into a separate assembly so that it can be downloaded to to the client. It's fairly mechanical, but you're right that the the big um, sort of the thing that tool can't handle is if you decide to take any dependencies on the server environment in your component code, then that's not something that we can handle for you because that's just op opaque code to us. So a good pattern instead is any any places where your component needs to access server resources is to put those behind some sort of service interface, like a, a, a contract, so that you can swap out those contract implementations when you move it to the client. Like if you're talking to the database directly on the server, do that through through, through some interface so that if you move to the client, you can swap in an implementation that does web API calls, for example, to the server to, to, to pull down that data. Dan, didn't, didn't you do a talk about that at some point? About swapping from one to the other? Yeah. I've done, I had a, I've had a sample. Or, or a talk that included it. <laughs> we, uh, yeah, oh, that's true. That's true, we did do that. It's been a while. So in our .NET Conf talk that Javier and I did, um, we were showing how you can use Blazor from an MVC application. Uh, and we start out with like Blazor server, but then we actually switch it to, to be Blazor WebAssembly. So you, you can go check out our .NET Conf talk if you want to see an example of making that switch specifically. Um, and there are various sample apps out there as well. Like there's even third party projects that will like allow you to toggle between server and WebAssembly using like a query string parameter or a, a config setting. Uh, so it's not very hard. Uh, just make sure you keep your component implementations hosting model agnostic. Uh, cool. OK. I guess Javier is up then. Close Did it you out. Know, hi. OK. Yeah. Let's see. It's going to be hard, I think. Uh, OK, so I love JavaScript. <laughs> I love Java. And I love CSS. Wait, who is the second one? I Java? love JavaScript, I love Java, and I love CSS. No, it's two truths and a lie, not three lies. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably the Java one. I think it's the Java. Well, but who loves CSS? But though Javier does. Javier, no, this is Javier. He like, does kind of seem to like it, doesn't he? Yeah. It's, 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 He'd be like, oh, let's rip out Bootstrap and like crack it and funnel up <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah. Like, like the way he talks amorously about like <laughs> CSS grid <laughs> and Flexbox. <laughs> yeah, OK. Yeah, I think it's I cool to say, be Java. Yeah, I want to say Java, too, because I've seen you enthusiastically write both CSS and JavaScript, mm -hmm. but I've never seen you and Java in the same room. So. <laughs> <laughs> Is, isn't Java and JavaScript the same thing? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm going with Java. That's my vote. Java. Java. Uh, okay, you're, you're all right. It's Java. Yeah. <laughs> What's wrong with Java? I mean, you're not a psychopath. <laughs> what you what you can learn from this, Javier, is that we all know you really well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
there are some really nice. I know some people are going to hate me for saying this, but there are some really nice things about JavaScript. Man, like like I, mm -hmm. uh, I know sometimes people associate Blazor with like hating JavaScript, but I actually don't think that's like Blazor and is intended to be complementary to the the web the set of web technologies, not adversarial. Yeah. Um, and I ever, sometimes when I code JavaScript, I'm like, man, there are some really nice simplistic things about JavaScript. Um, there are still some wonky things, but but it's come a long way. It's I remember when I tried was writing JavaScript really in earnest for the first time like ten years ago, and then it was like bonkers. Like I was like, what? Like like method scope variables? Like what is this craziness? Like there's no modularity. Everything's in the global names. But like a lot of those problems that I remember really disliking have, have been addressed by some of the, the the more modern versions of of JavaScript, and it's it's really kind of come of age. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I had six questions lined up. My plan was that we were going to cover all of them, but we spent so much time deceiving <laughs> each other that that's probably not going to happen. But there was one question that I wanted to um, kind of um, close off with in addition to any more audience questions that we have. Um, so, you know, people um, consume .NET or Blazor or, you know, the final work that we end up shipping. Um, but as someone who works on building that stuff, I'm so in on the day-to-day -day of building that thing um, that that's kind of what I find um, consumes my time, but maybe other people don't necessarily see. Um, so what I think would be interesting is if you could kind of share with everyone what you're currently working on um, and something that you've learned as a result of it um, over the past, like let's say week or something. Um, I can, I can start this off, I guess, um, since that's kind of been my, my mojo. So um, I've been doing some work to uh, migrate the Razor SDK into a different repo to make some things better and easier to do. That was a very great description of what I'm doing, but that's what I'm doing. Um, but as a consequence, I've been learning a lot about the Razor SDK and actually as a result of some other stuff I'm doing, I've been diving into the Razor compiler as well. Um, so that's kind of what I've been working on over the past couple of days and, and finding myself learning a lot about. How about you, Pranav, even though you already know everything? <laughs> well, no, no, not really. Um, yeah, like I'm, I'm also doing something fairly similar to what Safia is doing. So um, for like, you know, five, we spent a bunch of time trying to like make some of the inner loop uh, improvements um, better using dotnet watch and we want to keep like doing it over like you know even before you get to 6o like we want to sh ship it in but like vs updates um so like one of the uh, ways we can do it is like move it to a repo that's more aligned with like vs releases the same repo that safia is shipping like moving the the sdk to um so like uh, that's what i've been doing and hopefully we can get like more you know fun features for you guys to like for you know that improves our developers quality of life yeah have you learned anything i have learned nothing no <laughs> um, you know everything already. <laughs> no like i mean it, it's interesting like you know we we basically had um this tool that did a thing and then like you know had you know it's fancy test infrastructure and all that but like it's kind of interesting when we look at another repo and like they have their own sort of way of doing it and it's like huh why didn't we just do that like and you know it's like it, you kind of have to like you know sometimes start from scratch to like uh maybe rethink um, problems. And yeah. It's... Agreed. Steve, do you want to go next? Like we're doing the popcorn thing. <laughs> All right, cool. Well, I am working on a whole bunch of designs and prototypes for things related to .NET 6 features, because we're still planning out exactly what's going in and trying to figure out how much work is involved in it. So particularly trying to look at some of the more unknown areas like the hot reload thing that we mentioned earlier, various component programming model improvements, um, and trying to figure out some of the details about like what we're doing around Blazor Desktop and things like that, uh, doing a lot of customer support. Uh, in terms of what I've been learning in the last few weeks, um, well, my, my efforts to try and figure out how hot reload stuff can be made to work has forced me into the, the terrifying world of COM and um, just like terrifying low level windows uh, interrupt stuff and also other just general .NET native um, interrupt things and like string marshalling and all this kind of stuff, which is not something I've normally had to deal with. 
Now I know that I don't want to. All right, uh, how about Elon? How about me? Um, thank you, Steve. Um, uh, some of you uh, might know me from working on a project called Mobile Blazor Bindings. That is what I uh, continue to work on uh, features related to that. Mobile Blazor Bindings is a project that enables you to build, uh, use Blazor to build uh, mobile and desktop applications, either using native controls or using Blazor Web. And it builds on a lot of the work that Steve and the, and the rest of the folks on the Blazor team have been working on. And what I, the reason I'm here, um, aside from being, what am I? Other? What, what was I? What not? What not? What not? What not? I'm a what not. I think that's, that must be from a Dr. I've been reading a lot of Dr. Seuss recently. Oh my gosh. Um, so I'm a, I'm a which, what, who. And we are working on productizing some of the components of mobile Blazor bindings, in particular, uh, the ability to build desktop applications using Blazor Web. Uh, and um, that's what I've been working on. As far as what I've been learning, um, I've been learning how .NET is, I always knew .NET was a lot in terms of platform and reach and, and everything. But then uh, I've been working a lot with the Xamarin platform and Mono and .NET Core even more than I ever have before in terms of all the different platforms that it works on and uh, re-experiencing how much you can do with the .NET platform. Somebody just sent me a pull request uh, a few days ago, maybe a week ago, for adding Tizen support, which is, I think, Samsung slash Android mm -hmm. uh, support for building um, native applications. And that's wild that the .NET is so far reaching where you can write your code once in C Sharp using Visual Studio and where, wherever you want to run it, man, it's there. I knew it reached far, but it's crazy that people in, in a few lines of code can just enable these huge new scenarios. Yeah, it's cool. The Tyson, they've got like, you can write for TVs and watches and refrigerators and <laughs> pretty cool. You got to tag someone on. Oh, uh, 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 uh. Uh, uh, um, um, wait, who didn't go yet? Dan, oh, Dan, Dan, you're All right, right here. Sure. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I have been working on, let's say two things. I've been, I've been working with our friends on the razor tooling team on our, uh, improved razor tooling. If you haven't, if you haven't tried it out, there's a, a, a little checkbox in the, under the preview features in visual studio to enable the new experimental razor editor. If you haven't checked that, go give go give it a, a check and, and try out the new Razor editor for us and let us know what you think. Uh, one of the things we wanted to do as we improve the Razor editor, like we're doing a bunch of things there, you know, improve stability to improve the reliability of, of editing Razor, but also to add a whole bunch of, of features and functionality, like bring more of the uh, capabilities of, of the C Sharp editor uh, into Razor, like re full refactoring, renaming, those kinds of features are are coming soon to, to a Razor editor near you. Um, I've also been looking at doing a little bit of a, a refresh on the Razor syntax coloring that we use in Visual Studio and been learning all about color spaces and accessibility and keeping things reasonable contrast. H how do you pick color palettes? Like this is, this is one of the great mysteries of the world. Like those people that like decide on a set of colors that actually work well together like I, there are I, apps on the internet that tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then it's not. Razor has a lot of colors. Like there's a lot going on in Razor, so getting us a, a full set of colors that works together has been been an interesting task. I've also been just spending a lot of time looking at the getting started experience for ASP .NET Core and Blazor. Like watching users try out uh, .NET and and our web story for the first time. Uh, and just seeing where they get stuck. And that's been very interesting. Uh, one area in particular that I'm uh, trying to dig into is we see some on some machines uh, when they .NET knew their first app and try to run it for the first time, uh, sometimes it's a little slow and uh, sometimes shockingly slow. So if you've ever seen that happen where you like try to run a .NET application and it took a while to build and run, Please file a GitHub issue and let us know. We'd love to investigate to understand what's what's going on there. We're trying to make the the, the developer experience as fast and fluid as possible. So those those are things that I'm file that, file that GitHub issue where exactly? Uh, well, if it, I would say it depends on which kind of app you're building. Like if you're 
if it's um, if it's web, go ahead and file it in the ASP.NET Core repo, and we'll we'll start investigating it top down. Um, so most of the scenarios I've been looking at have been web, so ASP.NET Core, Blazor, MVC, Razor Pages, that kind of app. If it's a mobile app like Xamarin, then you should file it in one of the Xamarin repos. If it's a console app, go ahead and file it in one of the the, the .NET uh, Core repos. Last but not least, Javier, what have you been up to? So I just came back from vacation. So I've been working on like reading all the emails that people sent me and answering all the customers' questions. <laughs> yeah. If if you um, have ever opened an issue on the ASP in a core repo for Blazor, Javier has probably responded to it because he's very awesome about doing that, and I really appreciate him for it. So give Javier kudos for for being our issue responder person, customer advocate, and support. <laughs> What's what's on your uh, what's first on your backlog, Javier, to tick off once you get out of your uh, your email your email? Uh, I don't know yet. I'm trying to figure that out between tomorrow and and the next day. Uh, but I'm gonna be looking probably at uh, improvements across Blazor in terms of uh, things that we can do better with pre-rendering and and stuff like that, state management and things like that. Oh yeah, yeah, that would be great. Like st stateful. Pre-rendering? Do those two things go together? Is that is that maybe a thing, Javier? Maybe we'll see. <laughs> cool. So we've had some good questions come in. So maybe we can take a few more before we wrap up. That's all yeah. right. Okay. All so right. here. Okay, we've got a couple that are just on, on getting started. So this one here. Where do we recommend people get started learning Blazor? Um, I think our getting started tutorial is probably good if you have some prior experience with either .NET or web development in general. What I find personally helpful is actually a lot of the YouTube content that exists out there. Um, there's a really thorough but also intense eight hour video lesson on Blazor um, by Free Code Camp if you want to just get a full on deep dive. Um, then there's also some other video content um, that you can follow along with um, by quite a few people. I find videos um, really helpful. There is also a Microsoft Learn module. Um, there's build a web app with Blazor WebAssembly and Visual Studio Code that you can you can find on Microsoft Learn. Uh, that's another option. Um, if you're if you were just getting started, I would just go to Blazor.net, click on Get Started, go through the initial tutorial. That will then uh, point you to another tutorial that's a little bit more involved, like building a to-do list app with Blazor. From there, oh yeah, oh, and we have to mention the Blazor workshop. Like I, uh, uh, I would pizza. absolutely go check out the Blazing Pizza app Blazor workshop. That's at aka.ms slash Blazor workshop. And that's like a whole set of labs that will walk you through all, you know, building an entire application with Blazor. That's a great resource. Cool. All right. Uh, one other thing going with getting started is if you're creating a new app, what sort of server configuration do you want to set up? I mean, there's deployment guidance. I, I guess I would just point at that, right? Yeah. If you're, if you're creating a just a Blazor WebAssembly app, you can get away with just static site hosting. Uh, and in fact, we have an, a, a new, relatively new static site hosting offering on Azure called uh, Azure Static Web Apps, where you can host a .NET front end using Blazor WebAssembly um, and then have the option of using even a serverless backend using Azure Functions. So that's a great place to, to deploy your app if you're doing uh, Blazor WebAssembly. If you're doing Blazor Server, you're going to need a, a you know a server that can actually host the running server code, ma manage the the SignalArc uh, WebSocket connections that are coming in. Uh, an Azure App Service uh, hosting plan is a, is a great way to do that. Um, we have the Azure SignalArc service also to help out with connection scale out. Um, IIS, but I mean. Uh, if you're, you can go cross platform. You can use uh, your your favorite. You can use Kestrel on a, on a Linux based environment as well. That will work. You have quite a few options, and it really depends on what kind kind of hosting environment you need to deploy to, and which flavor of Blazor you're you're using. Cool. All right. I guess just two more here. So one is question on Blazor running as microservices, and I guess just there were a few more is related to like interaction with microservices and stuff. Yeah. Any thoughts on this? Or <laughs> that sounds like an architecture question to me, it Steve. It sure does. <laughs> um, well, the term microservices normally relates mostly to 
a back end because normally you you would have a, a set of different API servers and you'd call them microservices. So it's less well as associated with front ends in general. But people do talk about micro front ends where they they compose one overall front end UI from multiple independent UI deployments. For example, you could just use something as simple as an iframe to to pull in different uh, UI applications on different pages of a of a larger front end, or you could do something more complicated where you you somehow combine them at build time by um, you know sort of smushing all the source files together in some way. With Blazor, if you wanted to, if you were going to use Blazor um, for all of your front end uh, sites, even if you've got many of them, you could do them all in separate uh, C sharp projects, and then they'll just automatically become one thing when you uh, build and publish that. So that's quite a nice uh, pattern. Um, but for for more complicated things, I guess it would depend mainly on just what you're trying to do and what's unique about your situation. I don't think there's a, a single one recommended pattern for that. I think there was a micro front ends talk also uh, at .NET Comp specifically about using Blazor as a for from the micro front end pattern. So you might go check that out as well. I think it was it was done by a community member. I forget I forget the the, the person who did it, um, okay. but that would be a uh, another another place you could go look for some guidance. All right, cool. Uh, last one here is there were several about just you know are there commercial products and are there you know different things. So if you want to expand to that, that's fine. But uh, specifically on CMS, I know about Octane. That's kind of the main one I'm aware of. Yeah, yeah. Octane is a an open source CMS uh, system built on Blazor, um, and it's O Q O Q T A N E. Yes, O Q T A N E. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the the name of the project. Um, I think it's, it's run it's run by the the, the same guy that uh, originally uh, started uh, .NET Nuke back in the day. So that yep. later Sean. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So uh, yeah, it's a cool project. Uh, that that's what I would that's what I think of when I think of uh, a Blazor based CMS. Um, I mean, there's for ASMIC Core in general. There's also Orchard, and there's a couple a couple others out there with the um, CMS systems that are based more on uh, server side rendering. I, I think they all have some story where you can like integrate with some JavaScript frameworks if you need to do some client side logic. And so I believe you should be able to plug in some Blazor if you wanted to in those systems as well, but they're not inherently Blazor based. Um, mm -hmm. So that's, that may also be an option. Cool. All right. Well, I mean, there are some other, you know, it's hard to pick from all the questions, but I think that's probably a good, good uh, yeah. place to wrap there. Awesome. awesome. Thanks, everyone, um, for taking time away from bugs and features and sorting out builds to um, join this community stand up. And thanks, folks, for watching it live or if you're watching um, the YouTube video afterwards. Thanks for watching all of that. Hopefully you learned a lot about the team and the people behind Blazor. Um, I certainly did. Um, I will never look at Pranav the same, knowing that he could eat 12 semesters. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think we're gonna, gonna head out and keep building Blazor. Thanks for joining us. Awesome. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.